<clears throat> Thanks so much. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay? It's a great pleasure to be here, especially in this group of speakers. Um, and I'd like to talk today about uh, new technologies that can help us in the battle against complexity and uh, some applications for uh, drug development and uh, personalized medicine. So uh, just to give you an overview, first the problem, we're losing the war with complexity. I think this should be the, uh, apparent to everyone in the way with the attrition rates of drugs and our inability to control the most important diseases of modern mankind. And so we, what we need, I'll argue, is ways of seeing, of observing, or in, in system theories called observability, but it's a way to navigate through complexity, of provide a new technology which I think uh, really does a nice job with this, and for the first time combining the ability to broadly and globally screen and also to interpret it. To actually have functionally physiologically interpretable data, I'll give you a couple of examples, show you a new kind of microscope that uh, exemplifies this as well, and then I'll talk about personalized medicine at head. So I, we are losing the war with complexity. I've lived through 30 years of from bench to bedside medical talks, and there's always a molecule at the bench, and there's nobody in the bed. They never have a human being in the bed. So the reason is that we have these cartoonish pictures of, you know, we do this drug or nutrient, and it comes over here. But underneath it, this enormously, ineffably, unpredictably complex network really has, has this happen. But there is a solution. We all know it in everyday life. There are very complex activities that we control. You can coach a football game, but you need to see what's going on. You need to stop driving blind. So the idea is to make medicine and drug development, and particularly personalized medicine, uh, a series of measurements, not guesses. It's the way a doctor navigates to the ICU by measuring everything and keeping people alive way too long. That's what we want to do in everything else. So, so Lee Hood is a, uh, formalized this a little bit. He said, first of all, biology is it's about information. Biology is information science. It's got to be holistic information, global. It tells you the whole picture fully assembled systems. It has to be a systems approach. We need new measurements, new, new technologies, and the measurements have to be quantitative. Okay, so let me give you an example of a technology that we think, I think, uh, fits these criteria. It's what we call proteome dynamics, <coughs> excuse me, or dynamic proteomics, which is looking at the hundreds or thousands of proteins at once, but looking at their, their Synthesis, breakdown, transport, their movement. That's a, when, when the cell makes or breaks down a protein or transport it, that's a proactive decision that will reflect what's going on, what the cell thinks is going on, and often has an intrinsic functional significance. So the way we do this is by co combining uh, isotopic labeling, stable isotope, non-radioactive isotope labeling, with the brilliance of uh, these tandem mass spectrometers. And so this is a kind of a cartoon of what we do, which is give some, for example, heavy water, drink heavy water to a person or an animal, and then we, the, the, de the deuterium gets into proteins throughout the organism. We then isolate a tissue or blood, a drop of blood is enough. We do some uh, cleanup, we run, we trypsinize it, run, this all sounds harder than it is, it's very routine. And we run these thousands of peptides through a tandem mass spectrometer. The, the mass spec tells us where, where each of these came from, where it uniquely identifies this protein source, and then we look at the pattern of label and tell you the synthesis breakdown and all the functional information that we're talking about. So this here is a, is a picture you start, sorry, you start with a, uh, a non-labeled or st natural abundance uh, isotope pattern, and as you introduce label, you perturb that pattern. And so it's the per perturbation of this that we can interpret. These are big data sets with thousands of masses, but the, if through informatics, this can all be interpreted. And we use a technique we developed almost two decades ago called mass isotope or distribution analysis to deconvolute all this information and turn it into kinetics. Let me give you a really nice example that's uh, kind of hot off the presses for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. So I'm going to show you pay human data. These are, this is blood cells from people with CLL who drank some heavy water. Very easy thing to do. So first, we had shown about five years ago that if you give CLL patients 
first of all, if those of you who, who may not know, CLL is a funny disease. Most people die with it, some people die from it. If you treat everybody with CLL aggressively, the group does worse than if you didn't treat them. And yet there's maybe 20%, 30% who need to be treated. They will die from it. We haven't been able to find out who these are. So we found that if you give these oops, people heavy water, ah, um, you, and you look at, this, is, this here shows the trajectory of their CLL, their disease. This is a bad, aggressive disease. This is a flat, stable, indolent disease. If you find out, the, the, we turn out the aggressive ones were making cells like crazy, even though this disease was traditionally thought to be a cell of failure of apoptosis or cell death. These guys who had the bad disease not only had failure of cell death, but they had selected these hyperproliferative clones. And so we, we uh, found that that's, I, that that really distinguished these two groups of, cell, of patients. But it didn't tell us what was wrong, specifically, other than the fact they were making, they were aggressively proliferating their cells. So we then took the same data, we reached in the freezer, having developed this proteomics technique, and we took the same data set, and we measured, shown here is different types of proteins for a fast patient and a, for, sorry, an aggressive patient, which is to say a fast turnover patient, and a non-aggressive patient, which is, say, a, a slow turnover indolent patient. So these are two human beings. And we're shown here some 440 proteins out of a couple thousand that I could sh we could show. And so this is a, not a very informative l list, except each of these is the synthesis rate of a protein, so over 400 in this case. But when we interrogate this database with even very s fairly s simple literature-based software devices, we find that the, the, there are hundreds or, darn it, there are hundreds or dozens of proteins, sorry about that, that are increased in their synthesis rate in the aggressive patient. And in this case, 86% of these increased proteins in this patient could be explained by four transcription factors. Foss, June, Mick, and Mick N. So maybe these guys are involved in some, in some ideologic way in this difference between patients who have bad disease and not so bad. Now we can look at the data in other ways as well. So you can look just for different types of proteins. And in this case, we look, we identified, just by simple interrogation of the data set, uh, 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 so-called so 14-3-3 cell cycle proteins. And these guys are also upregulated. Their turnover is higher in the red, which is the aggressive patient, the fast turnover cell patient, than in the green, which is the indolent patient. So again, a potential biomarker, or even potentially a target for, for the, for the uh, management of these patients. And if you look, if you take that same data set and expand it outwards, you can find these are the 1433 uh, proteins, and these are other upregulated proteins of, in the cell cycle checkpoint uh, uh, classification ontolo gene ontology in this, um, in this particular individual patient. Now, so we've done the same thing in, uh, in HIV AIDS, and for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, one of the two or three big problems in AIDS nowadays is the uh, immune reconstitution. There's about uh, a third of patients who get good antiretroviral response but don't reconstitute their immune systems. And the thought is that maybe they, one hypothesis has been they have fibrotic lymphatic systems so, but, or lymph nodes, but this has been difficult to prove. So we gave some heavy water to uh, a few AIDS patients, did uh, these very simple perirectal biopsies, and we interrogated the cells through proteome dynamics. <clears throat> and you can see here, if you simply look at the hundreds of proteins and ask what is the most upright, ask the data, the software, what's the most activated proteins here? And what the data told us was that TGF beta mediated connected tissue uh, extracellular matrix proteins are, the, are upregulated. We didn't tell it that, it told us. Very interesting in a condition thought to be, hypothesized to be, of, uh, a disorder of fibrogenesis. And so if you don't, and if you look even closer, you find that the SMAD TGF beta pathway is particularly several proteins that are related to that pathway are upregulated in these individual patients. And if you look even, if you don't believe that, you can ask whether this correlates with some more uh, traditional metrics. So we correlate in these individual patients, we correlate a variety of protein synthesis rates in the, in the, in the, data, in the proteome database with collagen synthesis which is measured, and we find a nice correlation. And if you want to get even deeper than that, you can try to dissect the fibrogenic phenotype, which is, this is one of my favorite areas here. 
So what we found is, and again, we didn't come in this with this idea. The data told us, and then after the fact, we're brilliant. So what the data told us is that a certain protein called alpha smooth muscle or aortic smooth muscle actin was upregulated in, uh, in, in, uh, in, far other, in fibrogenic models in, uh, such as bleomycin models in the mouse. And the, the interesting thing here is that alpha smooth muscle actin is what's involved in when the, the profibroblast matures into the myofibroblast, which is the active phenotype. So what we're measuring here, it seems, we didn't intend to, but there you go, is what we're measuring is the synthesis of or the, or the differentiating of profibroblasts into myofibroblasts simply by asking uh, how much alpha smooth muscle actin they're making. So very interesting. This, and this is different than collagen synthesis. This would, would respond differently to a TGF beta than to a matrix metalloprotease inhibitor, for instance. Okay, so the point of all this is that what I'm talking about here is inferring gene regulatory networks from these proteome data sets. And I make the point of calling it gene regulatory networks, not transcriptional networks, because it, it doesn't just involve transcriptional factors. As uh, Dave Gales just pointed out, there's a lot of modifiers of transcription and trans of translation, such as microRNAs, there's post-translational modifications, there's, there's autophagy, ubiquitin proteasome. These are all part of the regulatory network that, are not, that will not be revealed by transcriptomics or microarrays. For example, a regulatory factor simply might stabilize a transcription factor, and you won't see that in a, in a microarray. So the next generation of this is to try to make it non-invasive, and so what we've, I'll give you a couple examples uh, before I close. So here's an example in muscle of using this, this proteome approach to, in a non-invasive, non-tissue-based way. So what we found was that if you, if, you do, if you take an animal and you give it an anabolic or catabolic stimulus, like uh, you give it a nerve crush, catabolic, or give it a uh, clenbuterol and anabolic intervention, you find that a variety of proteins go up and down. One of them is creatine kinase. It, mi it mirrors the, uh, the, the catabolic state of, the, of, of other uh, proteins. And we found then when we looked at humans, so this is here, human beings, drank, three different human beings, individual subjects who drank some heavy water. And first of all, you see that each, these are diff three different people looking for different kinds of proteins. You see that each person seems to have a characteristic protein turnover rate. Very interesting. Nobody had ever done this before. But not only that, circled here are creatine kinase. And that's, uh, which reflects the protein synthesis, rate, synthesis rates of the other proteins in, the, in, this, in these individuals. And these creatine kinase spills into the blood, as we all know, and we are now measuring this in the blood as a metric of what's going on in the muscle. A similar approach we've used in the brain, using to try to get some idea of brain chemistry by looking at proteome dynamics in the CSF. So shown here is a simple model for this. It's a complicated picture, but a simple model, where we give some labeled water to a person, and the cell body makes proteins, and then we determine how long it takes for these proteins to traverse the axon, the axon through axonal transport and get released into the CSF. And so a normal subject goes like this after a pulse of heavy water and dies away in the CSF. And we, the, the hypothesis was that in a person such as a Parkinson's patient or ALS with an abnormal or altered, delayed uh, tra axonal transport, the, the, the protein would get hung up and would take longer to appear and disappear in the CSF. So I'll just show you one slide that exemplifies this. And these are uh, a half dozen Parkinson's patients. The heavy water goes up and down. And what you see in the, in the black for three different uh, proteins, including SAPP alpha, alpha synuclein, and chromogranin B, which are all motor neuron specific cargo, you see that they are delayed in their appearance in the CSF. So if we do a single biopsy a day 20 or so, we can determine that these, the, whether a person has an axonal transport disorder, we think, by, looking at, by surveying the CSF protein uh, kinetics. So I want to summarize uh, uh, that this point that, that this, this, the idea of a dynamic proteome is, in my view, very interesting and very much different than previous omics tech approaches, because although it combines the broad un unsupervised features, it is also interpretable. It's much closer to phenotype than transcript. That's the whole idea here. And I've talked about target discovery and biomarker discovery, which are really the two uh, fundamental. And both of these, of course, are re relevant to personalized medicine. 
So let me just say one last word about a new kind of microscope that, that really takes this idea of kinetics uh, to the next level as well. It's, we call it a uh, metabolic flux microscope. We're doing this in collaboration with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories. And just very briefly, what you do is you take a laser you t uh, across the tissue section, and you raster across the tissue, volatilize pixel by pixel. Each of those pixels goes up into a mass spectrometer. We look at the isotope pattern, just like I described for lipids or proteins. And then you look, and then you do a kinetic heat map of that tissue. So you're looking at a kinetic, it's like insight to immunohistochemistry. This is insight to kinetic histochemistry. So here is a heat map of a mouse tumor. And this is the H&E section. This is the tumor. This is the H&E section. And this is a hot, uh, is, is hot for lipids. Well, that sounds funny, but it is. <laughs> but uh, it is. And so, and this is an example. We took two different, li uh, two different tumors, one aggressive, one not so aggressive. And um, we show here, this is actually the aggressive tumor. And it is a mu shown here in black and white with white is hot. Um, and this, is, uh, a, a, this tumor is clearly much more uh, hyper, hyperactive, and you can look at this in a uh, spatially identified way. So let me close then and talk about uh, what, how I think this all relates to personalized medicine. I, I do believe that personalized medicine is the future of medicine and drug development, and what it really requires is a deeper understanding of biology and the ability to measure all this. And I think it's going to result in the renaming of diseases. We're going to name them by their real ideology. Diabetes won't be diabetes anymore. It'll be diabetes type 11B, which will have another name. And so I hate to say this, but I think it has to be said that I don't think genomics and transcriptomics are the future of personalized medicine. They're helpful, but they're just too far removed from phenotype. In systems theory, genes exhibit weak control strength. They just can't predict. So I think functional networks really are the future uh, and so I want to just close with a quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes by Galileo, which I'll read. He called, he was talking about his spyglass, which is the uh, telescope, which revolutionized our view of where we, of man's place in the universe. And he said, the nature of matter of the Milky Way itself, which with the act of the spyglass may be observed so well that all the disputes that for so many generations have vexed philosophers are destroyed by visible certainty. And we are liberated from wordy arguments. That's my favorite part. So I'll end my wordy argument.